Do we really believe in the devil? And isn't believing in demonic possession and exorcism outdated? And now that we know the real mental health challenges that exist, shouldn't the church drop these outdated ideas of believing in the devil and in demons? If you've ever heard these forms of arguments made before, and if you've ever wondered what the church would answer to such accusations, then stick around. This video is for you. Welcome to Answers from an Apostolic Faith. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. What does the church believe about demonic possession and exorcisms? Do we really believe in a being called the devil? Are these even still relevant issues that the church has to deal with? The simple and easiest answer is, you better believe it. Demonic possession and satanic attacks are very real. And the Holy Church continues to minister to people who suffer at the hands of demons every single day. It's important to note that unfortunately, many people and even some Christians today would like to ignore the reality of demonic warfare by simply labeling it as mental health issues. These same people accuse the church of being outdated and even scold clergy who talk of exorcisms as if they are misleading people to believe in things that they claim to be irrational. And when we speak of such people and dig a little deeper, you discover that they simply don't even believe in the devil. And while they might claim to believe in Holy Scripture, they believe the idea of the devil was simply made up to control masses and not no such being exists. Well, the simple rebuttal to all of this is the following. You cannot possibly claim to believe in the Holy Bible and not believe in the devil and in all of his legions. Scripture is clear. The devil is in enmity with God and with us and that his legions desire our fall and our separation from God. In Genesis chapter 3, we are introduced to the serpent whom the Lord curses. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Later on, John the Evangelist in the book of Revelation describes the same serpent as the great dragon. The great dragon was cast out to that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. The Lord Jesus himself, when speaking to his disciples, confirms his existence by saying, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And again, St. Peter warns all, all of us as believers, to be careful by teaching, be sober and be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, says St. Peter. All of these verses, and many more like them, clearly point to the existence of the devil. So to not believe in him and deny his very existence is to stand against the Holy Scriptures. Now, what about demonic possessions and exorcisms? Are they real? Or is it simply people who suffer from mental illnesses? Well, again, let's turn to Scripture. It is estimated that when studying the Gospels, almost one-third of Jesus' miracles are healings that were dedicated towards exorcising demons. Now, to be clear, Jesus performs many miracles where he healed people of their bodily ailments, and that is a category on its own. And just as demonic possession is also its own category. Why then would anyone believe that Jesus' direct ministry of liberating people from demonic possession be confused with him dealing with people who are suffering from certain forms of illnesses? In fact, the Gospels themselves witness that even the demons themselves who had possessed the people, even they speak up and witness to Christ. A great example of this is found in the Gospel of St. Matthew, where the Lord encounters men who were demon-possessed and even living in the tombs. Let's read together. When he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a good way off from them there was a herd of many swine feeding. And so the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, Permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. When studying this text, and many others like it, it's clear that the demons recognize the greatness of Christ. They even call him Son of God and are subject to his very command and authority. The end of the passage even describes how the unclean demonic spirits were cast into the herd of swine and were drowned. The Lord would not have done so if this was simply a case of mental illness. 
Clearly the gospel writer wanted to faithfully convey this intriguing encounter and this exchange between the Lord Jesus and these fallen demons. Now, it is the same authority of Christ that the Lord Himself hands down to the church through the apostles. The Lord had sent them out two by two to spread the gospel. And upon their return, they witnessed saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. It is here that we first see the beginning of how the Lord bestows upon the church the gift of being able to exercise demons and to liberate those who are tormented by demonic attacks. And this gift given to church until today, that all glory may be given to God, who has given us authority to cast out Satan. St. Cyril of Alexandria explains this beautifully, and he says the following, The authority that they, the apostles, carried to rebuke evil spirits, and the power of crushing Satan, was not given to them that they might be regarded with admiration. It was given to them so that Christ would be glorified by their means. Those whom they taught would believe that He was by nature God and the Son of God. He was invested with so great glory and supremacy and might as to be even able to bestow upon others the power of trampling Satan under their feet. You see, it was not of their own power that they were casting out demons, but rather by the power of God who is creator and master of all beings. And in being obedient to Him and calling on His name, the apostles, and now even the church, casts out demons so that all glory may be given to God. We later see in Scripture how Christ Himself gave this power and ability to the apostles when establishing the church after His resurrection. He tells them in the Gospel of St. Mark, And these signs will follow those who believe. In My name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. The apostles themselves then took these gifts of the Holy Spirit and handed them down to their own disciples, the leaders of the church. That the Holy Spirit may continue His work through apostolic succession. Listen to the following passage from the Apostolic Constitutions, handed down to us by the very Apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. These gifts, the ones that were mentioned in Mark 16, were first bestowed on us, the Apostles, when we were about to preach the Gospels to every creature. Later, they of necessity were afforded to others who had by the Apostles come to believe. These gifts were not given for the advantage of those who performed them, but for the conviction of the unbelievers, that those whom the word did not persuade, the power of signs might put to shame. This gift of exercising demons that possess and torment people is preserved in the Holy Church until today and is being used to free people from this form of spiritual suffering much more commonly than many might believe. And so, if anyone out there still hesitates to believe in the devil, or has come to believe that demonic possession and exorcism aren't even real, then they have been deceived. The evil one continues to wage war against all of humanity. And it's because he is repulsed by the fact that all humans are created in God's image and likeness. And while we might not realize how much demonic oppression surrounds us, it is clear that the devil is hard at work, attempting to possess and oppress as many of God's children as possible. Now. While only some in the church have the gift of exorcism, because it is indeed a gift of the Holy Spirit, it is not given to all, we can still do our part in fighting the good fight. Our calling is to be like the apostles, to go out into the world with the name of Jesus, to reclaim all of creation back to God, starting with our hearts. Let us offer ourselves to God and ask Him to liberate and free us from all that might oppress and enslave our souls. And in so doing, May we also, like the apostles, come running back to Him, excited to have participated in the very work of the Kingdom of God. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to watch our previous ones by visiting and subscribing to our channel. If you find this content beneficial, share it with your friends. Remember, know your faith, live your faith, and teach your faith.